I'd like to um, acknowledge the sponsors that help bring our program together for us. Of course, the Northwest Business Club, but in addition, Doug and Robin Williams, Skagit Arms, Spartan Arms, Jaeger Sporting Goods, and Peterson Brothers Manufacturing. How about a big round of applause? For up to introduce our speaker. At the end, we will have a question and answer period. As a reminder, members of the club get to ask their questions before guests do. And I don't know that we'll have enough time to get to guests, but just sort of keep that in mind. Elliot. Good afternoon. I'm going to be very brief and basically just let you know that we have today here Dr. John Bottom. Most of you have already figured out what he's already done, and that's why you're here. So I will let him speak for himself. John, you've got the floor. Well, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, being told earlier about some of the great speakers that we've already had. So, uh, it's even better. so uh, I'm going to cover a few topics here uh, right now. I'm going to start off with health care a little bit. There we go. Uh, a lot of changes that are occurring right now uh, over time. Uh, you know, I don't know how much people have been following, but just in the last few years, uh, we've had a lot of pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer cut its research staff by about 50%. Merck's cut its research staff by about 60%. Drugs that would have been developed over the next few years or longer aren't going to be developed. And it's just going to affect not only the quality of health care and life in the United States, but around the world. You know, as business people, a lot of you, uh, if I were to come to you and tell you I can figure out how you can make your product offer more to your customers and do it at a lower cost, I don't think I'd have to force you to do it. I think you'd pay me to be a consultant and tell you how you can do it. And so, you know, when you have a politician like the president go and promise that he knows how to reorganize health care so that customers out there are going to be able to get a lot more services than they could have gotten previously, and the cost of medical care would go down at the same time, uh, you kind of figure, well, why do you have to have a law to force people to do it? You just go and advise them, and, you know, they'll pay you. You don't have to force them to do it. And the fact that uh, companies are being forced to do it and dragging their feet and screaming at the same time should give you some idea of whether or not it's going to be able to accomplish both of those things at the, at the same time. And you get some idea of what's happened to uh, health insurance premiums over time. This is from uh, uh, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. They do the Consumer Product uh, Price Index. But they also break it down by individual components, and this is for health insurance premiums. Basically, health insurance premiums were going up, peaked in, uh, in mid-2007. We're actually falling on average uh, up until uh, the beginning of 2011. And since then, uh, it had a very dramatic increase. The beginning of 2011 were when the first uh, regulations started going into effect for Obamacare with regard to uh, health insurance. Okay. I don't know if you guys may want to move over there. Uh, you guys see stuff over there? The, uh, this is pretty, pretty, I'm a numbers guy, so uh, it only, only is going to get worse in terms of graphs and numbers. So, uh, so I, I apologize in advance. But, um, uh, you know, beginning in uh, this next year when we have the, uh, the state exchanges being set up, uh, the cheapest insurance that individuals are going to be able to buy is going to be about $7,100. That's the so-called bronze plan. Just to give you a comparison, right now the average insurance premium for an individual is, uh, is a little bit over $5,000. Uh, so you go from an average from about 5000 to a minimum of 7100 For a family of four right now, the average is about 14000 And minimum, the bronze plan under the Obamacare system is going to be a little bit over 20000 for a minimum. So you go from an average of 14000 to a minimum 
of uh, of play. So. Uh, <coughs> because people affect their life expectancy a lot. So in the United States, we have a relatively high rate that people die in automobile accidents. Americans just tend to drive faster, riskier. Americans are much more obese than people in the rest of the world. Our smoking is a little bit below the average now, but uh, people are overweight, and that more than offsets the lower smoking rate. And so, uh, you know, unless you want to go and give the healthcare system responsibility for the number of car accidents that people have. But the best way of measuring the quality of health care is to go and say conditional on getting sick. Where would you rather be sick? If you have to be sick, what country in the world would give you the longest life expectancy given that you're sick? And the United States wins hands down. I don't know if you can see it from this distance, but this just gives you some idea of five-year survivorship rates for cancer in the United States versus Europe. For prostate cancer, the five-year survivorship rate in the United States is 99.3%. In Europe, it's 77.5%. Uh, you look at uh, skin melanoma in the United States, it's a little bit over 92%. In Europe, it's 86%. Breast cancer is 90% in the United States and 79% in Europe. There's no country in Europe that has a survivorship rate for any type of cancer that's above the five-year survivorship rate for surviving cancer in the United States. There we go. Okay. Just one way, now there's, there's other issues that deal with uh, quality of health care. And one simple comparison you can make is surveys that are done of individuals about you know, how fast they get service, the quality of the medical care that they receive. And if you compare the United States to, uh, or in the United States, if you look at people who have health insurance versus those who don't, you get some surprising results. And the normal notion is that if somebody doesn't have health insurance, that's often thought of being the same thing as them not getting health care. And that's simply not the case. In fact, you have over 90% of Americans uh, in, overall are happy with the quality of their health care service. It's even higher for people who are sick, people who have chronic illnesses. You're talking about, across surveys, someplace between about 93 and 95% of Americans with chronic illnesses who are happy with the quality of the health care that they receive. It's really hard to find almost any other industry that has anywhere near that type of consumer satisfaction rate that's associated with the products that they're providing. It's lower for people without health insurance, but it's still something in the high 60% range, which is still relatively high. The interesting thing is if you take the exact same surveys and ask people in Canada, for example, how satisfied they are with the quality of their health insurance, is that Canadians covered by their government system are almost exactly as satisfied with the quality of their health care as Americans without health insurance. <coughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, just, I could go through this. I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see this too much right now, but uh, 
You can go through, the, some of the questions are how satisfied are, are you with the quality of the health care you receive? How satisfied are you with the ability to get a doctor's appointment when you want one? How satisfied are you with your ability to see a top quality medical specialist if you ever need one? How satisfied are you with your ability to get the latest, most sophisticated medical treatments? And basically in all of those, you see that pattern that I was saying, that people with health insurance are much happier uh, than the other two groups, but you see that people without health insurance pretty much match Canadians in terms of how happy they are. So I want to talk a little bit about the economy. You know, uh, I think a lot of people have an idea how bad the economy's been and how weak the recovery has been. But I think the numbers are actually a lot worse than, than people might realize. Uh, you know, there's two ways that we normally look at uh, uh, recoveries. We normally look at GDP growth, we look at things like unemployment or jobs. Uh, the thing is, the normal measures that we've had for measuring the recoveries just simply don't apply this time. And uh, you look at the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate peaked at about 10%, right now it's down to about 7.6%. But there's two ways you can lower unemployment. You can lower unemployment because people have gotten jobs, or you can lower unemployment because people stop looking for work. You're only defined in the United States as being unemployed as long as you're actively looking for a job. This is the first recovery we've seen anything like this. Almost 80% of the drop in unemployment has been due to people giving up looking for work as opposed to people going and getting a job. And some of these graphs here I think will kind of illustrate the point. If you look at the percentage job growth that we've had in this recovery, there's basically, oops, there's basically a few ways you can look at this. This green line in the middle shows the average job growth that we've had uh, in recovery since 1970. Usually you have faster job growth after you've had more severe uh, uh, recessions. And you can see, so on average, we've grown almost 10% in the 47 months uh, after the first recovery. So this is updated through the main numbers. Uh, after severe recessions, we've had over 12% growth over the same period of time. After mild recessions, we've had almost a 6% growth. And right now, in this current recovery, the growth has been about 2.5%. So you can see here, it's uh, you know maybe about a fourth of the job growth that you would have seen during the average recovery. Can I see the clicker? So I don't have to go up and down. There's also a point that we have a point. That's all right. I got my hands here. So <laughs> anyway, you can just see. And the thing is, one way to look at it. recessions has actually gotten larger. You know, I could just kind of graph out. If you look, compare the job growth, the percentage job growth between the current recovery and after severe recessions, you can see how it keeps on getting bigger and bigger in the gap. After the average recession, it's still getting bigger and bigger. It's still the highest it's been overall. And even after mild recessions, the job, the gap in job growth is still getting larger between the recoveries after mild recessions in the current one. So, uh, you know, we've seen job growth, it's true, but it's very slow compared to anything that we've seen previously. This talk's going to last longer than I would have thought. Sure. Okay, yeah, this is good. Now, uh, I just get, it, those charts look bad, but it's, but when you dig into it, it's even worse. And the reason is, is that <laughs> the reason is that uh, this is the first recovery that we've had that we have data for that hiring per month is lower than it was during the recession. You know, during recessions, 
hiring per month falls, but it goes up then when the recovery starts. And, the, and you can see just here, if you look at uh, the period prior to the recession, we had about 5.2 million people being hired per month. It fell, understandably, during the recession down to about 4.4 million per month. During the recovery, it's been about 4.1 million per month, and now it's back up to about 4.3 if you look at the data for the last three months. So it's still below the average, slightly below the average it was during the recession. Now, you ask yourself, well, if we're hiring fewer people each month, how is it that we have any net job growth? Well, there's two things there. There's hires and they're quits. You can kind of think of it as kind of water level in a pool. You know, you have water coming in as hires and quits are as water going out. And um, what normally happens over a business cycle is that quits fall dramatically during a recession because people are afraid to go and leave their jobs because they're worried they're not going to get another job if they go and quit. But after recessions, particularly after long recessions where people have stuck with a job where they may not be very satisfied with, as soon as the recovery hits, you usually see a big increase in quits. Longer the recession, the bigger the increase that you see in quits. Again, this is the first recovery that we've ever seen where quits actually are lower now than they were during the recession. <coughs> and so, you, this is the pink line here, you can see uh, quits during the, uh, prior to the recession were a little bit less than 3 million a month. Here it's about 2.3. It's down below 2 million during the recovery and now it's back up slightly above uh, 2 million. So we have less water coming in the pool in terms of hires, but we have quits have fallen by even more than hires have fallen, so that's, you know, the water coming out, so that's the only reason why the water level's gone up a little bit, even though, as I showed you in the previous graph, it hasn't gone up by very much. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> next slide. Uh, isn't that what we just saw? Okay, there we go. So another way you can kind of look at this, just to see how the recovery's been going, is to one measure of how hard it is to get a job, and that is hires, not just job openings, but actual hires as a, as a ratio of people who are unemployed, still looking for work, and those who have, have uh, those not in the labor force, those who have just left over the period of the last year. And you can see how kind of the ratio of people hired compared to these other things has changed. And so you have all the you know people looking over the number of hires, and that ratio soared. It's come down a little bit, but it's still dramatically higher than it was uh, prior to the recession. Next slide. Now, the other way you can look at this is in terms of GDP growth. What's happened it, throughout American history is that uh, there's kind of a normal growth in GDP. When you have a recession or a depression, it falls, but then it pretty quickly gets back up to what the trend line was previously. Here's what it looks like uh, during the, you know, the beginning of this last century, and you have the depression that hit in the 1930s. You can see the growth. It didn't quite get back up. There was another little uh, hiccup during the 37, 38. But you can see how it falls and how it ends up growing much faster than kind of this average slope. Can I see the next one? Okay, so here are the recoveries during the 70s and, uh, and 80s. And you can see here uh, there's a recession in, uh, in the 1970s. It kind of gets back up to the trend line. Here's the reset Carter recession that started in 1980. Basically, it gets back up pretty quickly to the trend line. Here's our current recession. It falls, and the gap between kind of the normal trend and where we're going is getting bigger and bigger with each passing quarter. So, you know, so they say, well, it grew, you know, so it grew, but it's growing much more slowly. After you had a recession, you usually have this very fast growth for some period of time until you get back to the old trend. We're falling farther and farther. That's not happening. We're farther, falling farther and farther 
behind the trend. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that's come up a lot in uh, the debate, the president raised it in the sequester, and I'm sure when we get to uh, uh, the uh, debt ceiling limit increase later in the year, it's going to be raised again. And that is the president says, well, we have to keep increasing government spending. If we don't increase government spending, that's going to hurt the economy. And uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because if you go back to 2008, it's kind of hard to believe that he was arguing this at the time, but probably the most frequent promise that the president made during the 2008 presidential campaign was he promised a net cut in government spending. I mean, you don't, you don't believe me, go and read the transcripts for the presidential debates, particularly the second and third presidential debates uh, just weeks before the election. Uh, where he even said himself that he's been mentioning it constantly during the campaign that he promised a net cut in government spending, a government that was smaller at the end of his administration than it would have been beforehand. And uh, if you look at just the first two years of the Obama administration, federal government spending grew 21% over and above the growth in inflation during that period of time. Adjusting for inflation, that's the largest increase in government spending that we've ever had in our country's history over a two-year period of time. Even World War II did not have, you know, the run-up in World War II didn't match the increase in government spending adjusted for inflation that we had during the first two years of the Obama administration. And, you know, the irony is, uh, even with the stimulus, he promised it would last for one, maybe two years, well, now we're five years into the Obama administration, we're told we still can't even slow the rate of government growth or it's going to hurt the economy. Here's the irony. If you look across the countries in the world, the ones that have had the big increases in government spending or the big increases in government debt, they're the ones that have done the worst in terms of economic growth. And just a couple uh, examples here. So this is uh, looking at the changes in government spending and then the subsequent changes in employment growth. And you can see here, the countries over here are the ones that have had either no net growth in government spending as a percentage of GDP or it's actually fallen. You know, countries like Germany, Israel, Switzerland, Poland, Hungary, <clears throat> they're up here. The countries that have had large increases in government spending Iceland, Ireland, Estonia, Spain, were the ones who subsequently had the biggest drops in employment. These countries have actually had increases or at least much smaller drops in employment than the other ones do. So, and you can see the same pattern with regard to government spending and GDP growth. The ones that have had the biggest increases in government spending have had negative GDP growth, the ones that have had uh, constrained government spending have been the most careful, have had positive growth rates. Next one, please. Where's the U.S.? Uh, well, uh, yeah, was that? Yeah, what's that? It's on the previous one. Go back there. So the U.S. is right here. So it'd be someplace around here. I didn't mark it. I probably should have. Okay, next one, please. And, uh, and you can see there are other measures. I'm not going to go through, so why don't we skip this. But Krugman and others, you basically get a similar pattern. Oh, went too far. One more. One more. There we go. Now, uh, one thing that's become almost the Bible in, uh, for the Obama administration is this book uh, by a couple friends of mine, Rogoff and uh, Reinhardt. Uh, you know, uh, this time is different. And. Uh, Basically, what they claim is that after financial crises, you have slow economic growth. Well, there's an easy way to test this. I mean, they go and argue it's a little bit arbitrary how you define countries as having faced a financial crisis or not. So what I just said, their book came out in 2009. So I guess let's just take the countries that they defined at that time as having faced a financial crisis versus the ones that didn't and just see how they turned out. Do you see a difference, rather than me having to have my own definition of what countries fall into what category? And they had uh, 19 countries that weren't facing a financial crisis and 10 that were. And this is just 
looking at the labor market. So this is the percent change in labor force participation rates. And I look at this, and you know the dotted line are the ones that didn't have a financial crisis. The solid line are the ones that did. And it looks pretty identical to me. Statistically, it's you can't see a statistically significant difference. Next one, please. Now you can break down uh, the ones that face the financial crisis even a little bit further, because it turns out out of those ten countries, you basically had two, Spain and Ireland, that did really poorly. And the other ones, excluding Spain and uh, Ireland, actually did pretty well, even the ones that faced financial crisis. So it's pretty hard to go and argue that just because you have a financial crisis, you're going to have a weak recovery. Only two of those 10 uh, had that. And you can compare it to the United States. The United States is this dotted line right here. You know, they classify us as having a financial crisis, which we did. but. You know, we're doing much worse than these other eight countries that face this financial crisis. Next one, please. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about guns. It's going to be different from what I'm going to be talking about guns this evening. But uh, I, one of the reasons why I wrote uh, my recent book at the break was not only to deal with the coming debates on health care and uh, the economy, but I think the president's going to have a big impact on people's ability to go and own guns. I'll just give you one example of that, and that is um, uh, back in February, I was asked to go and do uh, a couple debates in, uh, in Colorado. And uh, the big news when I got there was that the day before, uh, the vice president had been calling up members of the state legislature to go and lobby them to go and vote on, uh, on a gun control bill that was coming up uh, a couple days later. And, <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever heard something like this happen. I mean, I guess it just shows how much the administration cares about the gun control issue. But you had Vice President of the United States calling up members of the State House saying, look, if you vote the right way on this gun control bill, which was basically a tax on people being able to go and purchase guns or transfer guns, the promise was the president would help them raise money next year when they campaign. And if they voted the wrong way, then the White House would get involved in trying to uh, get opponents to run against them in the Democratic primary. So, look, nothing's wrong about that per se from my point of view, but it just shows how intensely this administration, the fact that a, a White House, I mean, it's one thing to go and get involved in congressional races. It's another thing for a White House to go and get involved in state house races, uh, in primaries, there, uh, you know, uh, two thirds of the way across the country. Next slide, please. So, uh, uh, and they were successful. They were able to get uh, seven members of the state legislature that had promised to vote one way on these gun control bills to switch their votes, and that was enough to get those uh, three bills passed that they ended up getting through. Next, please. So, what I thought, because it. Just in the last day or so, uh, the news reports have indicated that the administration is going to be pushing for the background checks bill again. And so uh, I just thought I would go through some of the claims that have been made for that. It touches a little bit on what the sheriff was bringing up earlier. And there are a couple of big claims that have been made. One claim is that, uh, and you've heard this lots of times probably, uh, the president said this on January 16th. But it's hard to enforce the law when as many as 40% of all gun purchases are conducted without a background check. That's not safe, that's not smart, that's not fair to responsible gun buyers or sellers. Uh, you know, on March 28th, he pretty much repeated the same thing. I may give you like 15 quotes like this where he said, as many as 40% of all gun purchases take place without a background check. Next, please. So where does this number come from? Uh, if you push them, there's a study by the National Institute of Justice that was published in uh, 1997, and it was a survey, a small survey of like 251 gun purchases that were made from 1991 through the end of 1994. A lot of those purchases, the vast majority of them, were done even before the Brady Act went into effect in, uh, in uh, February uh, 1994. But uh, 
you know, the interesting thing is the study, the original finding was this, from the study was that 36% of transfers were done without background check. The president changed it to 40% of gun sales. Well, you know, the rounding up from 36 to 40% is the trivial thing. The most important thing is changing the word sales to transfers. You know, uh, because the vast majority of those, that 36% of transfers were within family gifts and within family inheritances. When the president goes and talks about sales, that's not the image that I don't think most people come away with. And that almost all those, uh, with, you know, within the family inheritance or sales are basically, uh, or transfers are with, you know, parents giving gifts to their kids, either as gifts or as inheritances. Uh, so, next one, please. And that's even an underestimate. So what if you take that survey, and I don't believe the survey, I could spend a half hour or an hour going through the problems with this tiny survey that was done by the Clinton administration. But let's say you believe it, you just ask the question, uh, what percent of sales, and that one it, it indicated that about 13% of sales were done without background checks. Now, there's a couple big problems with this survey, just one I'll just mention, that is you're asking people whether they perceive that they were buying from a federally licensed dealer, not showing whether they actually were or not. And I don't know if you remember this, but you go back to 92, uh, 93, there are about 280,000 federally licensed dealers in the United States. By the end of the Clinton administration, it was down to about 100,000. That 180,000, or about two-thirds cut that you had in the number of dealers, were so-called kitchen table dealers, primarily. People who would sell you know, four, five, six guns a month, or whatever, out of their home. Uh, they were basically taken out of business, either through uh, regulations or additional fees that had to be paid. And why is that important? Well, the reason why that's important is because when I've interviewed these FFLs that used to sell out of their houses, and they tell me that there's no reason why anybody who'd buy a gun from them would know that they were a federally licensed dealer at the time. It's not like they have a sign in front of their home that said federally licensed dealer. You know, people would know if they go and buy from brick and mortar whether or not they're a federally licensed dealer or not. But you have this huge set of sales that were being done where there's no reason for them to know. And, uh, and if that's the case, it's a lot, you know, it's very likely that a lot of this 13%, when you're asked, did you buy from a licensed dealer, wouldn't know whether they bought from a licensed dealer or not. But one irony is that if you actually believe the survey, the survey claimed that 100% of guns purchased at gun shows were bought from licensed dealers. So, but you know, it's a, so the same time that the president goes and cites this one, he then goes and talks about the gun show loophole. Next one, please. Uh, well, I'll just give you some bottom line numbers here. Ninety-three percent of the gifted guns in the in the survey came from within families, and ninety-one percent of inherited guns came from within families. I don't think it would have quite the impact if the president would say, "Look, there are just too many parents giving their kids <laughs> guns here." that aren't being regulated sufficiently. Those are not the types of images that come to people's minds. <laughs> so here's another one that's important. Uh, the presidents use different numbers over time. It depends on the time period he looks at. If you go back to January, he was saying over the last 14 years, that's kept 1.5 million of the wrong people from getting uh, their hands on a gun. You know, more recently, he's used it over the entire Brady background check period, we don't say that about two million prohibited people have been prevented from uh, being able to get a gun. Next one, please. So here's the, here's the thing. Again, it's just a change in the language. So uh, what you should say is rather than two million prohibited people have been prevented from getting guns, the correct terminology is that saying that there have been two million initial deniers. <coughs> There's a huge difference between saying an initial denial and prohibited people preventing. Let me give you one example here. You may remember the late Senator Ted Kennedy. Five times he tried to fly, and he was, uh, his name was on the no-fly list. There was apparently someone else who had a similar name, not necessarily the identical name, who they really didn't want to stop from flying, who 
uh, who would cause Kennedy to be flagged. So he was initially denied five times. He later flew. I assume, though, that the president wouldn't want to count that as five times we stopped a terrorist from flying. <laughs> and, but yet that's the way they counted with regard to these initial denials for guns. So, uh, and in fact, when you look at the data, it looks like at least, we can't tell for sure exactly what the number is, but at least 95%, and I think over 99%, of these initial denials are false positives. So uh, Ted Cruz, who's a good friend of mine, I don't know, I, you know, he's made mistakes. Rand Paul, others have, where they'll go and they'll say, Ted has said, for example, that um, uh, 15, in 2010, 15,000 felons were prevented from buying guns because of background checks. And then he attacks the Obama administration for not prosecuting those individuals. Well, Bush didn't prosecute them either, or Clinton. And the reason is, is because they're not real cases. Just because you're, deni you're, you're denied, or initially denied, from purchasing because of felony, doesn't mean that that's the guy who had the felony. It means that you had a name similar to someone who had a felony who they were trying to prohibit from doing it. Yeah, you understand the distinction? Yeah. And so, um, now I understand why they make the argument. And the reason why they make the argument is because it allows them to attack the president as not enforcing the gun control laws. I understand. But a strong argument is just to say, look, the current system is messed up. It's not working the way it's supposed to work. You know, to go and say two million prohibited individuals have been prevented from buying guns shouldn't be shouldn't be a badge of honor. It should be something we're ashamed of, where almost all of that two million are law-abiding citizens who have stopped for months from being able to go and obtain a gun. Look, if private, private companies do criminal background checks all the time, if private companies had anywhere near the failure rate in terms of falsely identified people, they would be sued out of existence. And, <laughs> The thing is, the reason why the accuracy rates for private companies doing criminal background checks on employees is so much higher is they include a lot of information. You know, social security number, where you live. They just don't, basically the federal background checks look at a similar name, and the government doesn't tell us exactly how they define a, what's a similar name, but we know it doesn't necessarily include the middle initial. And generally, spelling of names can be similar on a phonetic basis than an actual written basis there. Uh, so there's a lot of leeway that you have there. Uh, you know, it's not, so, not Joe Smith, but it could be, you know, I could have somebody who's a Joe E. Smith and a Joe L. Smith, and I'm still going to link them. Uh, the other thing that's included is their birth name. So when you have common names in a large country, you're going to have people who have uh, essentially, even the same birthday are going to get flagged because there's going to still be somebody out there who's going to have, uh, uh, you know, even with that qualification, still going to have a similar name to you. Just like Ted Kennedy was flagged uh, five times. Next one, please. So, so anyway, you can look at these numbers. The sheriff was going through these a little bit. I'll just mention briefly. If you look at 2010. Sheriff's right, there were 76,000 initial denials that happened there. Uh, only, so there's like four different <coughs> review stages that are there. After the first stage, only 4,700 of those cases were referred after the first stage review to the second stage, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearm and Explosives Field Offices. So 94% are dropped. And if you read the annual report, basically it says, the remaining denials, 94% did not meet referral guidelines. And these are objective rules. These are not, there's no discretion at this stage. Uh, did not meet referral guidelines or were overturned after review by Brady operations or after the FBI received additional information. These last two qualifications are clearly false positives. <coughs> you know, overturned after review basically just means they looked at the file more carefully, realized that they had made a mistake. Additional information is the same thing. The referral guidelines, the main reason 
that uh, something doesn't meet the referral guidelines is that it's classified as too old of a case. You look through these cases that are referred, and some of them are four and a half decades old. So I don't know, you know, again, you can't, senators, others have asked the BATF for class clarification on this. Next one, please. But if you look at this, 62 cases were referred for prosecution. 18 of those were declined by prosecutors, so they only went forward with 44. And out of those 44, they got 13 uh, guilty pleas or verdicts on that. Now the thing is, if you look through those 13 cases, they're not what we would think. I mean, it's not, they're not, these are not hardened criminals. I'll give you the worst of the cases that's here, the most egregious. Uh, this one dealing with this one four and a half decades old. There's a 65-year-old man, his wife, had gotten threats. He decided he was going to, she was talking about getting a concealed carry license. He was going to go out and get her a gun that she was going to carry. He went to the store, filled out the forms. Uh, apparently, 45 years earlier, he had gotten into a fist fight with his brother in their front yard. <laughs> Neighbors had called the police. They had been arrested. They had pleaded guilty to a domestic uh, <coughs> misdemeanor domestic violence charge, which is a prohibited offense. And he claims he didn't realize it was a prohibited offense when he was filling out the form. The prosecutor successfully argued that there's no way he wouldn't have remembered the case, and that by reading the form, it would have been clear that it would have been a prohibited offense. And so he was convicted for perjury, which is based on what they get these guys on, which is a three-year prison sentence in this case. Now, Though, as I said, that's the most egregious of the 13 cases that you have there. But the other ones are like 20 years old or so in terms of these offenses. It's hard, I'm not going to say none of them, but the vast majority of even these 13, or you look at other years, are not what you would call hardened criminals. Criminals simply aren't going through and trying to buy guns through this. Okay? Kind of the next one. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, uh, you know, I, I understand why people make the arguments that they do on these things, but I think uh, there's a much stronger argument to be making. And, and here's the problem, just to kind of summarize this, and that is everybody wants criminals, not to obtain guns, particularly violent criminals. And the problem is, when you look at these surveys where they go and, you know, they say 80% support background checks, when you read the questions, it's actually some idealized form that's there. They're saying, basically, the question comes down to, do you want to stop criminals from getting guns? I'm surprised it's not over, well over 80%. And so, uh, but the, we live in a real world. Government doesn't always operate as perfectly as we would like it to operate. <laughs> and, and so the problem that you face is that when you're talking about two million people, the overwhelming majority of those, it's a simple inconvenience. They'll live with it. But when you're talking about two million people, you're talking about what would still be a small but significant number of people who really did need to get a gun quickly for self-defense. Being delayed for months may make the difference between whether or not they would have successfully been able to defend themselves or not. The problem's even broader than that. It's just not people who get locked up in the system for months in terms of the delays. But you have another number, about 12 million people, who are de delayed for about three days being able to go and buy a gun. Uh, three days isn't months, but even three days in a s very small number of cases can make the difference between whether somebody is going to be able to defend themselves. A woman who's being stalked or threatened may feel the need to get a gun quickly for self-defense. My research looking at the impact of that indicates that even just that three-day delay is associated with a small, again, I'm not going to say large, but small but statistically significant increase in both rapes and aggravated assaults against women. About a 2% increase in rapes and a little bit over a 2% increase in aggravated assaults against women. So, you know, you're not talking about all women, just a small number of cases there overall. But it's still uh, statistically significant. So that's the trade-off that we face. And look, when we talk about expanding the system, what I wish somehow the discussion would basically be, 
Can we fix the existing system so we don't have all these false positives that are there? Can we make the government operate its background check system so it's more like a private company would have to operate its, its background check system? Because if you don't fix it and you go and add millions more names in because of you know, some vague definitions of mental health and things like that, you're going to create a lot more false positives. The odds that your name is going to match somebody else's name in the United States who's going to have the same birthday, who is somebody that they want to try to prohibit, is going to go up. And the number of false positives, the number of people who may need to get a gun for self-defense are going to rise. And so the question you have to ask yourself ultimately is, how many bad guys are we stopping from getting guns? And you can see from the numbers I mentioned, the sheriff mentioned earlier, are basically almost nothing. Versus how many law-abiding citizens are we stopping who really need to get a gun quickly for self-defense? That, to me, is the bottom line there. And unfortunately, that's something that's not being brought up in this discussion. Anyway, I've talked about several issues. I know you have questions. I'm happy to go and try to answer any questions that you have. We'll go over other gun issues. Oh, I did want to mention one thing. The sheriff mentioned the huge increase in concealed carry permits. I'll just mention this. Take the two years that he mentioned. I just have, happen to have these numbers off the top of my head. In, uh, in 2007, there were about 5 million concealed carry permits in the United States. Uh, as of the end of this last year, there were about 9.3 million. So it's not just, and it's not just because we've had a lot of new states suddenly do it. Obama's had an impact not only on gun sales, but I think on uh, concealed carry permits uh, in general, and a uh, uh, huge change. So anyway, anybody have any questions? I guess 25 minutes for questions. Again, remember, members first, raise your hand and be called one, then stand up and ask a question, and we'll start with the sheriff. Uh, just one question, Professor. Does your research look at, examine any of the, uh, not necessarily from gun sales, but people that come in contact with law enforcement that are hardened career criminals, they carry firearms, uh, or in possession of firearms, and using them in the, in, to commit new crimes, and the federal prosecutors, the U.S. attorney, we could bring really the, the bear down, the power of the federal government for what those laws were designed, simply declined to, to prosecute those cases against repeat dangerous offenders. Right. I, mean, I don't have those numbers mentioned off the top of my head, but surely there is an issue that you have there. I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a rhetorical question on your part. But, uh, you know, sure, there's a real problem here. Look, uh, i just make a general comment, and that is, to me, it's more important that you punish severely the crime that's committed rather than how people commit the crime. I think you get kind of more bang for your buck if you go and you concentrate on having a penalty higher for murder or for robbery than necessarily how people committed the murder or the robbery that's going to be there. But I, you know, you're, I obviously agree with your general point that's there. I, look, I think if anybody's read More Guns, Less Crime or Freedomnomics, uh, I think I make it pretty clear. I think police are the single most important factor for reducing crime rates. Uh, I think higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates are extremely important in making costly and deterring criminals from committing crime. Uh, I would add, though, that even though I think they're the most important factors to police, you look at surveys of police, police are really strongly in favor of supporting individuals' uh, rights for Second Amendment rights. Uh, I'll show you some numbers tonight, but. Uh, you know, it's like overwhelming, 90% or whatever police officers, because they know how important guns are to themselves. They, and they know that they almost always arrive on the crime scene after the crime's been committed. It's hard to think of a group of people that are more supportive as a group of uh, individuals' ability to go and protect themselves. There's a question over there. John? Go ahead and pick them in all, if you like. Stand up and ask a question. I don't have a question, but I could speculate that you might have some concern about being in the gun sites of the IRS. Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not so far, so, but uh, uh, I will say one thing. My grand, one of my grandfathers was audited for 30 years in a row after, uh, after 
uh, he was involved in a Senate campaign down in Florida back in the 1940 or so. But uh, the, uh, so I mean, this is something that's gone on from time to time. Surely it's something that's a concern. You know, the interesting thing to me is all these scandals kind of, in some sense, it's bad that they're all together because you have things like Sibelius going and strong arming companies that her, her department regulates. You know, it's like two minutes in the news. And obviously, in a normal time, that would be a severe abuse that would get a lot of attention. On the other hand, the fact that you do have these abuses makes some of the other things, some of the other scandals, more understandable for people. Because the fact that the federal government can go and abuse its power so much, I mean, some of the things that have worried me the most with the IRS scandal are things like the IRS leaking tax documents, private tax documents, to political opponents uh, in the Democratic Party. So you have John Eastman, who's a friend of mine who I've known for a long time. He has uh, uh, this uh, organization in defense of marriage. Uh, his tax documents from his organization were leaked to uh, some of the groups on the other side. And, and so they know, knew who the donors were in his group. And those donors then were able to be harassed by Democratic Party members. So, you know, he was able to see the drop in donations that they had as a result of that. You know, it's that type of power. But, you know, I like to believe that uh, things like the NSA stuff, that the government would never go and abuse that type of stuff. But the, I'd also like to believe that they wouldn't abuse things like the IRS data that we have there. The fact that so much power is there, uh, you know, whether it's threats in terms of Sibelius or other things. Uh, I think in some sense, as I say, it's gratuitous that all these scandals are at the same time because in some sense they show the overall power of government, they show the possibility uh, of abuse, and uh, uh, I hope it educates Maybe he has a question over here, sir. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I live in a neighborhood where there have been a number of thefts and we've got a real people sign in our yard. And we're pretty well known, my husband's a safari hunter, and we have never been robbed. Nobody's ever tried to rob us, but we've got neighbors who have been repeatedly robbed. Are there statistics about gun-free zones or, I mean, comparing whether or not if people are likely to defend themselves they're less likely to be victims? Right, well, in fact, that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So, but I'll just basically say, yes, there are a lot of statistics with regard to that. Um, you know, I, I just mentioned one thing. Um, uh, you know, there's this recent issue in uh, New York where one of the newspapers published uh, the names of people with licenses for guns. There was actually an earlier event similar to that a few years ago in uh, St. Louis. And uh, some academics did a study to see uh, for those zip codes where, you know, by zip code, the zip codes that had the most cut, revealed the most gun owners there, what happened to burglar rates in those areas afterwards. And they found that after, uh, after that information was released, the zip codes with the most gun owners saw drops in burglar rates, and the ones that had relatively few saw increases. <laughs> but there's a lot of data I can go and talk about gun free zones in general. Let me just some point, one last point on that. And that is, I often debate people on the gun control issue. One of the questions that comes up sometimes is, I'll ask, would you put up a sign in front of your home that said this home is a gun free zone? I've never, I've never run into somebody that I've debated who'd be willing to put up a sign like that for her home. And I think we our schools. You wouldn't put it in front of your home, but we'll put them up in front of other areas. Yes, the lady in the back. Uh, in your opinion, why do they want to take our guns away? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. Here we go. Uh, if you look at gun control in terms of surveys, uh, gun control actually produces the biggest differences between self-identified liberals and conservatives of any issue. You have a bigger difference between liberals and conservatives on gun control than you have on abortion, 
or you have on taxes, even. And uh, I think some of it just comes down to who do you trust to go and do things? You know, do you trust you know, just experts, or do you trust uh, individuals to be able to go and have responsibility for doing things? You know, I can only speculate. I think I wrote a whole book, The Bias Against Guns, on why people have the views that they do on guns. Uh, I'll just mention one or two things. One of the big things that I think affect people's views on guns just generally is uh, news media coverage. You know, if you think about it, I mean, without trying, you can probably recall what seemed like thousands of news stories about bad things that happen with guns. How many times, on the national news, how many times have you listened to the national evening news and heard stories about people using guns to protect themselves, or protect somebody else? Maybe a few times over your lifetime, or a few times, but it's going to be very limited. And I think that has a big impact on people's perceptions about the costs and benefits of guns. Yeah. How lopsided that is varies across the country. If you live in an urban area, even though most of the defensive gun uses occur in large urban areas, those are also places where even the local media don't co doesn't cover uh, defensive gun use. Maybe it's just because there's so many other news stories, I don't know, one can get into it. But I think that helps explain a little bit in terms of the geographic differences that uh, people have in terms of their views about guns. But I think it has other impacts on people. If you, uh, if you don't have the ability to go and protect yourself, people feel more dependent upon government than they would have otherwise. I suppose somebody who's more you know, conspiratorial person might think that there's a desire to do that because then people will turn to the government more just like they may turn to them if, you know, healthcare or welfare payments or other things. They're more dependent upon those types of things too. But, uh, but I think ultimately it's just this first point that, um, you know, kind of the issue of who do you trust? And, uh, you know, do you trust individuals or do you just trust uh, experts to do it. The interesting thing, as I was mentioning before, if you look at the people in the field, street officers, how overwhelming the support they have for letting individuals the actual experts. You know, the, I, I just mentioned one last thing, and that is, um, uh, I was just giving a talk yesterday at Portland State University, and there's an opposition there from the administration to let uh, campus police carry guns. Uh, after 9-11, uh, there was a bill that kept on coming up uh, that would allow police officers with 10 years of experience when they traveled to be able to go and carry their guns with them. To me, it seemed like a no-brainer. Here's someone with 10 years of experience. They're willing to carry a gun for free. You know, if something happens, they're willing to go and step into the breach, <coughs> risk their own safety, whereas other people be running away, to go and try to stop some bad thing from happening. They're willing to do it for free, and we won't let them do it. You know, for 13 years, it was filibuster. It was five, Ken, late Senator Kennedy, who I mentioned earlier, was leading the filibuster on it because somehow, uh, but they were able to get over 40 Democrats to oppose it each year. Uh, somehow, even though we trust these police officers, you know, with their lives, while they're on duty, somehow five minutes after they're off duty, we don't trust them anymore. And, uh, um, but, you know, so it's not just, it, it's just not opposition to individuals having guns. It's opposition generally to anybody having guns, even people who have had 10 years experience as police officers. And uh, so that's, you know, you really, anyway, I, I can go, I can give, uh, you know, say days of lectures on that topic, you know, in the back. Um, Stand up. Yeah, Perspective-wise, it's when we made our first gun laws back in the 30s, why can't they make any gun law now? I mean, why do people roll for the original no machine gun rule? I mean, I, I, I struggle. I look at the argument now, and I look back then and go, well, you know, machine guns actually are very expensive to shoot. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have trouble understanding why it went through then so easily. They've set precedent to make all these rules now. What, what, what's the well, principle? The reason why I went through relatively easily then and not as easily now is uh, the, how many people are affected by it. Basically, when you had uh, the regulations on machine guns, 
uh, you had to pay a, a, a tax, essentially $250, which back at that period of time was a pretty hefty tax that people had to pay. Uh, you know, prices had probably gone up about tenfold or more since that time, so you're like $2,500 tax right now. But, you know, it didn't ban them completely. Uh, you had to pay the tax. You know, I'm sure there was some opposition, but we just, you have to understand, the highest murder rates we'd ever had in the United States was in 1932. Uh, and we'd just gone through prohibition. There was a lot of gang, you know, mob activity trying to control areas where alcohol was being sold. And America had been traumatized a fair amount by that. Um, so, you know, now we're talking about regulations which are much broader, and in some sense, you know, much more nonsensical. I mean, here we're talking about assault weapons bans, you know, one of the things that were brought up. And uh, I don't know if you know what they are, but essentially it's a semi-automatic gun that just looks like an automatic weapon. So you have, so you have, so the AR-15 is what's talked about a lot. And the thing is, the AR-15 looks like the M16, but it functions like any hunting rifle. So if you were to, let's say, let's ban all semi-automatic guns, I at least say, well, that's at least logical to do that. But you ban guns, you argue about banning them based on how they operate, not how they look. You know, an AR-15 fires uh, the same bullets as a small caliber hunting rifle with the same rapidity, doing the same damage that's there. And so, you know, ban all semi-automatic hunting rifles. The, ban the thing is, I don't think they want to go and make that argument because the majority of guns owned in the United States are semi-automatic of one version or another. And I think most people would realize that that was going too far. But if you go and just say, we're only going to go after a certain category of guns, but even then, it really didn't get very far. And I think the reason is we've been there, we've tried that. We tried the assault weapons ban for 10 years from 1994 to 2004. They had magazine limits there also. A lot of academic research, even research funded by the Clinton administration that didn't find any benefits for some of the reasons we were just mentioning. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think also we've had a lot more history. We've had things where areas have tried to ban guns completely. You didn't have that in the 30s. If you told people back in the 30s that some cities would go and try to ban people being able to have handguns, I think you would have gotten a pretty strong reaction at that period of time. Um, but now we know, now we've seen those types of bans. We've also learned what's happened when you've tried to ban those guns, the big increases that you've seen in violent crime rates. So I think that's one reason why people react more strongly now than they do to having a tax on one particular type of gun that very few people own at that point in time. But you're right, machine guns right now are expensive. The cheapest machine gun you can buy, which probably doesn't even work, would be about $15,000. And, and obviously, if you go and fire a lot of bullets, you can, you know, you can rack up a pretty hefty bill pretty quickly. Maybe you can buy the bullets. Right. Well, uh, yeah, uh, is there a statistical benefit for somebody just happily having an NRA sign in their yard? Does that deter? Well, it could. I don't know. I mean, uh, it seems reasonable. I don't know any way we can test that. But, uh, the, uh, you know, I suppose these uh, licenses for having guns are probably about the best we can, you know, when that's publicly reported in the media, is probably about the best way of trying to test that. According to the University of, I believe it's Colorado, if we as women are attacked, we're supposed to lay back and say, okay. I spent uh, four years teaching women's gun safety classes to women so that they were proactively taking care of themselves. Mike Hughes and Rick Lentz are doing the same thing right now. Do you see an increase in women's uh, uh, concealed carry permits out there? Do you see women becoming more proactive to take care of themselves? And Secondly, do you view us as a citizen's army that is more likely to be on the scene of a crime than the police officers who unfortunately can't be called until it's going down? Well, uh, those are all good points. Look, um, 
My research convinces me of anything. One of the things it convinced me of is that there's certain people who benefit much more from owning guns than others. And one of the well-defined groups are basically women and the elderly. People who are relatively weaker physically benefit much more from owning a gun than, let's say, younger males do. And the reason is you're almost always talking about a young male doing the attack as the criminal. And when you're talking about a young male attacking a woman, you're talking about a larger upper body strength differential that's there. And the presence of a gun represents a much bigger relative change for a woman's ability to go and resist an attack than it does for a man. You know, there's something called the uh, uh, National Crime Victims Issue Survey by the Bureau of Justice Statistics. They survey about 150,000 people each year. They've been running this survey for over 30 years, so there's a huge amount of data. And they have very detailed data on characteristics of the criminal, of the victim, where the crime took place, what the crime was, how the victim responded, and what the final outcome was in terms of the safety of the victim that was there. And what you find consistently is having a gun for everybody is by far the safest course of action, though it's much more important for women to have it than men. Um, you know, there are lots of things you can do to resist an attacker. You can, uh, you can yell, you can run away, you can use a baseball bat, a mace, a knife, a stun gun, or a gun. Uh, for women, the most dangerous course of action for women to take is to use her fists. And the reason why that's the most dangerous is that when a woman's being attacked by a male, there's a large strength differential that exists there, and you're likely to get a physical response back. The second most dangerous course of action for a woman to take is to run away. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can run away and escape, that's great. The problem is, is that women tend to be significantly slower runners than men are. And in the process of being tackled and subdued, there, and additional violence that can result from that, there can be significant injuries that can occur. And so, look, um, as I mentioned before, police understand the benefits of people having guns because they understand, even though they're so important, they almost always arrive on the crime scene after the crime's been committed. And so, uh, you know, and I think women are beginning to recognize this. You've had uh, not only a big increase in the number of concealed handgun permits, but the percentage of the permits that are held by women has increased. It's still uh, a minority, but you go back 10 years ago, you'd be seeing something in the high teens or 20% level for concealed handgun permits. And now you're probably talking about something in the low 30% range in most states that we have the data for. So that's a fairly big change that's there. Um, uh, but you know, the other group of people that I would argue benefit the most are probably not represented here, but I would just say it's basically poor minorities, particularly blacks who live in high crime urban areas. People who are most likely to be victims of violent crime are the ones who benefit the most from having the option to be able to go and protect themselves. And uh, you know, so much of the gun laws that we have basically are disarming those particular people. So you live in Washington, D.C. According to the Washington Post, you have to pay $534 to go through the licensing and registration process to get a handgun. Who's going to be able to pay $534 to go through that process? It's basically, and you look who gets the permits, it's basically a couple thousand wealthy white males in the city that's there. And, but, you know, which is fine. But they're not the ones who are most likely to be victims of violent crime. And uh, you know, Chicago, similar type of thing. Look across the country, this big push, the big thing that the Obama administration's been pushing for <laughs> on gun control has been primarily to push these feet. In Colorado, uh, the big bill that the administration was pushing for, the strongest, was the one that would impose fees on the transfer of guns. The Republicans put up two amendments that were voted down. One was to put a cap on what the fee would be. Uh, the governor and the Democrats argued that it had to, they didn't want to have a limit. They would figure out at later dates what the fee should be. Uh, but the other thing, so that was voted down. The other thing that was voted down was that Republicans wanted to have an exemption for people below the poverty level from having to pay that fee to go and obtain a gun. And, and that was voted down also. I mean, you have to ask yourself, why would they oppose having an exemption
for people below the poverty level from having to go and pay that fee. I mean, how many other exemptions for people below the poverty level having to pay taxes or fee would Democrats vote overwhelmingly against in this yeah, case? Yeah. And, uh, uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, you did the very good very last that. question. We have sex ed classes and we have driver's ed classes. We don't have uh, gun ed classes. How do you feel about that? Because I think that would be the best way to achieve what you want, what, you're, what you've been talking about. And uh, I mean, why not? I think everybody would be a lot safer that does buy a gun. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, I have no problem with people being educated about guns. Uh, you know, obviously, I think you're going to have an uphill battle getting that. Uh, but um, you know, on the other hand. Uh, I'm not sure I trust most educators yeah. to go in and <laughs> you know, you, uh, you just look at these things like these zero tolerance uh, rules in different schools where kids you know, bite into a Pop-Tart and maybe looks like a gun and point a finger at a fellow student and uh, they get suspended for those types of things. There's just uh, something in uh, in California, where there was a, a gun buyback of toy guns at, uh, at uh, the school there. And uh, the principal was interviewed and basically said, well, the reason why they were doing the gun buyback was because of these toys, was that he felt that if they let kids grow up with toy guns, then they would be more comfortable around guns as adults. And so he thought it was important to kind of make sure that they wouldn't be comfortable. <laughs> and so I think it just goes to the fact that there is this type of indoctrination that they want to try to do, which is the reason why, you know, otherwise it's hard to explain why they don't even have common sense about whether, you know, uh, biting into a Pop-Tart or <laughs> pointing a finger, not even going like this, but just pointing sometimes, uh, they view as uh, threatening and weapon type way for a six-year-old, but I don't even know how they think about these things. But, um, but in any case, we have to take the mic back from you. <laughs> we, unfortunately, we're out of time. I a big round of applause. <laughs> you remember, if you want to tell me about the book, if you want to tell me about the book, if you show up at 615, um, you can get, you can buy books and have the book autographed, signed. So I hope to see a large number of you tonight. And on the way out, I want to thank one more time our sponsors, Doug and Robin Williams, Skagit Arms, Spartan Arms, Gator Sporting Goods, Peterson Brothers, and the Northwest Business Club.